we've been talking about um, a lot of characters, specifically in the book of Genesis so far. Um, Sam, uh, lead pastor, if you're new here, that's the guy who's been speaking to the assistant pastor. My name is George. He dresses better than me. Um, and um, we've been talking about these characters and sort of their significance both in their time and then kind of in the long-term theme of Christian theology, right? Like, the, and, and, and Sam called it the True and Better series, right? So we've been talking about, like, Abraham and, and Isaac, for instance, the true and better son, you know, sacrificed, or almost sacrificed, and then, you know, how that compares to Jesus, or Peter talked about Melchizedek the, and how Jesus was the true and better priest king. Um, and now, after Abraham and Isaac and this random guy, Melchizedek, we've come to Jacob, kind of a familiar character for the most part. Um, at least we've heard of him. We may have never heard of Melchizedek, but we've heard of Jacob before. And Jacob, Jacob is one of the most central figures in the book of Genesis and is a cornerstone for the history of the nation that unfolds after him, right? Indeed, he is renamed Israel from Jacob. And he becomes not only the, a patriarchal figure for God's chosen nation, nation, but his name is the eponym for an entire nation. This guy would seem to be pretty central to God's plan and purpose for his people and for the world. And this morning, we're going to get a bird's eye view of his life and how it progresses and how it changes. And we're going to see the character of this man, Jacob, where he starts, where he ends, and how God relates to him, right? He's a man who faced a lot of conflict, his brother, his uncle, to name a few, over his tenure here on earth. He's, he's a man who both dealt out treachery and received it, and we'll see that. He deceived and was also deceived himself, and he starts out more or less indifferent toward God. And as we move through the stories, we're going to do essentially a character study of his life, moving along at an appropriately fast pace. You could almost preach sermons on a lot of these stories that we're going to tell. But today we're kind of soaking in the big picture of how he progresses. What happens in this life of Jacob? Who is he? And how does he relate to God? It's fascinating. And so when we meet Jacob for the first time in Genesis 25, feel free to flip to Genesis 25 if you want. I'll be, I'll be naming the chapters that kind of we're summarizing and occasionally reading sections of them. But if you kind of want to follow along, especially if you're not as familiar with the stories, feel free. Um, so when we meet Jacob for the first time in Genesis 25, he's still in the womb, struggling with his brother. And this little detail portends much of the rest of his life. His mom is a bit perturbed by the apparent war going on between the twin brothers in her belly. And so she inquires of God, and he replies with this prophetic pronouncement, right? So his mom asks God, what's going on? This is what God says. It's verse 23. The Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb, and two peoples will be separated from your body. And one people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. The older serving the younger was a big deal. The birthright of the firstborn, which constituted a much larger portion of the father's inheritance, along with judicial authority in the family. It was very clan-like back then, so the patriarch kind of ran the show, right? <laughs> judicial authority in the family and a general pride of place. That's what happened to the firstborn in that culture. And Rebecca is told in this prophetic pronouncement that this cultural deference to the firstborn is going to be reversed. The older will serve the younger. Something like that was not going to happen easily. So we're cued to the fact that something is and will be amiss in the relationship between those two babies, those twin babies. So okay, as the audience, we're paying attention. So Rebecca comes to turn and delivers the babies, and the child Esau is born first. We as the audience are looking at each other, right? She may not have told anyone else about God's response that prophetic ink to that prophetic pronouncement, but we know about it. And so the first thing we think is, this is the guy who's going to get screwed out of his birthright, right? This is the guy who's going to get flipped over, reversed, whatever. Esau comes out first, and clinging to his heel, this is a strange thing, clinging to his heel during his exit is his twin brother, right? Naming someone back in the time of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, was a significant event. 
Names often reflect the character of an individual, the circumstances of their birth. Like Rachel, when she dies in childbirth, uh, she names her son Ben-Oni, which means uh, son of my suffering. Jacob changes the name to Benjamin, son of my right hand, and that's where we get the name Benjamin. Um, but so it kind of reflected the circumstances of his birth. Um, and, and these names were vested with meaning. They, they took names very seriously back then. Sometimes we name children because it sounds cool, um, which is fine. I, that's fine. Um, and sure enough, this heel-grabbing baby is named heel-grabber, <laughs> right? Ekev in Hebrew means uh, heel. Yaakov means somebody grabbing the heel, right? But it's a double entendre, and this is, this is the important thing. It's a double entendre because it, it means also someone who supplants, someone who supplants or someone who replaces because Ekev also means footprint, right? And so the picture with this name is painted of somebody who's essentially walking in the footprints of somebody else and replacing their footprints, right? That's the double entendre. Rebecca knew about it. She chose this name. Right? They or they chose the name together, it says they. So she and Isaac chose this name, but I think she had more than just the heel grabbing in mind because she'd heard that prophecy, the older will serve the younger. Right? And so if you, were, if you were at the scene, you might not have gotten that, but I think Rebecca knew. And so already at birth, we see Jacob as this warring brother who will, in some way that's not likely savory, remember, this was the norm in their culture, the elder got the blessing, in some way that is not likely savory, replace his brother as the leader of the family. And that's exactly where the story goes. Skip forward 15, 20 years, who knows. And what do we do? Um, we find Jacob, and we get a little, um, I guess we get a little anecdote about their family life, right? If we thought that him being born second wasn't enough to secure his his status as being the lesser brother, right, in that, in that patriarchal culture, the narrator tells us this. This is verse 27. When the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the field. But Jacob was a peaceful man, living in tents. Now Isaac loved Esau. Isaac was their father. Isaac loved Esau because he had a taste for game. But Rebekah loved Jacob. Isaac's love for Esau as a typical man's man is understandable. Not only was, his, was he his pride and firstborn son, but he was a skillful hunter and an adept warrior with the bow, right? Everything Isaac could have hoped for in a son. Jacob, by stark contrast to his brother, it says he was a peaceful man who lived in tents. It's kind of a strange expression, lived in tents. But do you know who stays in tents in Bedouin culture even today? Any guesses? The women. The women, right? And so Jacob is characterized by the narrator as this sort of effeminate character who likes to cook with the women as opposed to being the man's man who kind of runs out and shoots the deer or whatever, right? That's Jacob. So naturally, he's a mama's boy. And so it says, Rebecca loved Jacob. Isaac loved Esau, his man's man. And what do we find Jacob doing immediately after that statement? When Jacob had cooked stew, he's cooking, okay? Um, so he's cooking it in verse 29. He makes a stew, and in walks Esau, famished from running around hunting or something super manly, right? And mama's boy tent dweller Jacob sees an opportunity. Sees an opportunity. He schemes. And he's like, I'll give my nice homemade stew to you, manly brother Esau, if you sell me your birthright. And Esau does it. So, that's important, right? It doesn't just tell us how, how Jacob is an opportunist, but it, it, it lets us know that Esau is a moron for doing it. Because, I, I, the funny, it, I, we can't go through all the details in the story, but the character painted by him is he basically walks in the tent and he's like, I'm hungry, go and die, give me red stuff. He says, give me the red stuff, okay? But here we meet Jacob. Okay, so, Jake, so, so Esau is stupid, Jacob's an opportunist. And here we meet Jacob, whose name will be eponymous, an eponym, with God's chosen nation, Israel. And he's this scheming little opportunist mama's boy trying to steal away his brother's private place as the firstborn. Interesting. Interesting. So skip over to chapter 27. It talks about the death of Isaac after that. 
And then we see, or we get to the death of Isaac, sorry. Isaac sees he's about to die, right? He's like, he, he senses it. He's like, I'm getting close. So Isaac wants some nice game from his man's man, hunter, eldest son, Esau, because he, like, he likes the deer or whatever. I don't know. What they like. Probably some kind of deer. So he tells him, hey, he tells Esau, hey, I'm probably going to die soon. Make me my favorite meal of wild game, and I'll bless you as the eldest. This was the norm. He was passing on his, his blessing, the covenant that God had made with them, and everything else. So the birthright's about to pass to Esau, and Esau sets off, bow in hand, ready to do his hunter Esau thing once more, right? So then the camera pans to Mama Rebecca, who had been waiting in the wings, spying on the conversation, right? Mama Rebecca remember, had been told a certain prophecy at the birth of Jacob and Esau. So she conspires with Jacob, her mama's boy, to snatch that birthright from Esau. She tells him to grab some sheep, slaughter them so that she can cook Isaac's favorite meal, although Jacob might have been able to do it. But she wants to cook Isaac's favorite meal and fool him into thinking it's Esau, not Jacob, so that Jacob receives the blessing, right? Jacob's on board, but he notes that Esau is, well, a bit more hairy than he is, right? That's what he says. Man's man Esau versus mama's boy Jacob. It's funny how this all pans out. But she's got a plan for that, too, and makes an impromptu covering of goat hair that should suffice, which really seems strange. But Isaac was old and losing his eyesight enough that this just might work. Just might work. So the camera pans to Isaac's tent, all right? And in walks Jacob, covered in goat hair, wearing his brother's clothes so that he smells like him. And Isaac's like, who's there? And Jacob lies through his teeth. He lies through his teeth. It's me, uh, it's me, Esau. Brought you that deer you asked for. Isaac's like, well, that was fast. A little too fast. How'd you do that there, Esau? Um, the Lord your God did it. Great God you've got there, Dad. There's a clear, notice, this is important, notice the clear distance that Jacob puts between himself and his father's God. Your God did it. Not God did it or my God did it. Your God did it. That, hey, it was your God, the, the one that you used to tell me about, right? He did not blindly ascribe to his father's faith. The jury's still out for, for um, but the jury's still out for Isaac as to whether this is Esau or not. And he knew Esau was there. He knew his son. So he's like, well, let's have a feel of your arms then to make sure, Right? Strange scene. Imagine if this was a movie. And hey, Mama's scheming, Mama Rebecca's scheming worked. Felt the goat hair, and he's like, okay, I guess it's Esau. But one last time, Isaac still isn't sure. One last time, Isaac is like, are you really Esau? He just asked him directly. Jacob is just a con artist. He does not skip a beat. Yeah, Dad. And Isaac has him lean in. So he smells his clothes. For Esau. And then he's like, all right, that's good. I guess that triggered something in him, you know, the smell of the clothes, the wild fields or whatever. And so he pronounces the blessing immediately. This is in chapter 27. I'm going to start reading at verse 27. It says this, see the smell of my son is like the smell of a field which the Lord has blessed. Now may God give you the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and an abundance of grain and new wine. You're going to be totally blessed. May people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be master of your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be the ones who curse you and blessed be those who bless you. Remember God said that to Abraham a long time ago. Passing this all down to Jacob. Right? It's not word for word what God spoke to Abraham, but you get the idea. It's close. And the rest of it goes down the rest of the story after this goes down almost like a play. The, mom that, the moment that Jacob sneaks out of the tent, blessing in hand, metaphorically speaking, in walks Esau. Dad, meet. Isaac freaks, right? Well, who the heck did I just bless then? Because he knew it was Esau, right? Who the heck did I just bless then? And in case we were wondering if Isaac could just get a do-over to bless Esau instead, he reiterates in verse 33, and yes, he will be blessed. Uh, that is the person that I bless. Esau's like, bless me, bless me. And Jacob's like, or Isaac's like, too late. Too late. And he will be blessed. There's no do-overs. This is it. That was a solemn spiritual pronouncement 
right? The blessings of the patriarchs. They had, they had significance. They had weight, right? So Esau freaks. Esau freaks. It says, he cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry, right? He's like, me too, Dad, me too. But what was done was done. Isaac replied, your brother came deceitfully. That's a sneaky person. And has taken away your blessing. This is I, or This is Jacob. This is the, just always think, this is the guy who heads up the nation. Then Esau makes this editorial comment about his name. Yeah, Jacob. Remember, it means supplanter. He says, yeah, Jacob is right. Because that's exactly what he'd just done successfully. And that was that. Our deceitful Jacob had, in two blows, snatched Esau's birthright and blessing. And as the audience of this unfolding story, our eyes are now fixed squarely on Jacob, this inheritor of faithful Abraham's covenant, right? This guy who had taken the reins, sneaking about. <clears throat> now, remember the prophecy at his birth. It's not like he was ruining God's plan. I think this is worthy of noting. It's not like Jacob was ruining God's plan. But at the same time, his character is coming out. More and more, the more we know. So, Esau is naturally perturbed at this whole situation. And, he, and it says he bore a grudge against Jacob. And if you see in the Old Testament, anytime you see something that says like, and such and such hated, or so and so hated so and so, or so and so bore a grudge against so and so, it wasn't mean like, I'm going to be emotionally angry at this person for a while. It, it means they are going to take action. And that's what it says. Esau was going to kill him. He said, as soon as my time of mourning is over for my father, because Isaac died, I'm going to kill Jacob. That no good, insert word. Mama Rebecca hears about this, right? And Mama Rebecca won't have Mama's boy who stayed with her in the kitchen going and being murdered by her twin brother. Nope. She yet again intervenes on behalf of her son. She goes to Isaac. I'm sorry, this is before Isaac. Right? She goes to Isaac and concocts this big story Right? She weaves a web so that she can get Jacob out of it. She goes to Isaac. She concocts this big story about how Jacob just has to get himself a wife right now from far, far away. Not one of these Canaanites next door. Right? You can just see the wheel spinning. How can I get Jacob out of here fast? She's like, give Jacob, or how? and she tells Isaac, give Jacob a wife or I'm going to die. Right? She's, it's very dramatic. <laughs> and more importantly, so she wants him to get a wife from a long, long way away, not from one of the Canaanites. And more importantly, a long, long way away from the land that God had promised Abraham. All right, so we just saw Jacob inherit this blessing and this covenant, right? And immediately we see Jacob about to flee the land that God had promised. Do you remember when Abraham got a wife for Isaac? If you've ever read that story, we actually didn't talk about it. But Abraham tells his servant to, to, to go get a wife, go, go, to this, go to the land of my kinsman, basically, and find Isaac a wife. He can't marry a Canaanite, but whatever you do, Isaac cannot leave the land. That's what he says. Whatever you do, you swear to me, you make an oath under God that Isaac will not leave this place. Why? Because it was part of the promise that God had made to Abraham, and he saw it so critical that, he, that Isaac stay in the land. And here we see Jacob getting ready to flee, the person who's inherited the covenant from Isaac. Things are getting a little iffy, okay? So sure enough, Isaac listens to Rebekah and blesses Jacob on his journey. That's 28, 3, and 4. And away he goes from home, from family, from the land, and with little allegiance to his father's God. Remember, your God, Dad, and his grandfather's God, Abraham's God. So the covenant that God made with Abraham seems to sort of hang by a thread at this point. And our protagonist, Jacob, sim simply schemed his way into receiving the birthright and promise. And here, just two generations after this covenant was made with Abraham, things are sort of hanging by a thread. So Jacob is on his way out. And then in verse 28, or in, in chapter 28, verses 10 through 22, there's the story. It's a very familiar story, right, of uh, a stairway or a ladder going up and down between heaven. Jacob falls asleep. He's on his way out. And then in a dream, God appears to him, and he sees this stairway going to heaven and angels ascending and descending, ascending and descending. And God um, talks to him in the dream. He's like, hello, Jacob. It's me, Abraham's God. 
Isaac's God, the one I told you about. And this is what he says. This is, this is uh, chapter 28, verse 13. I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give it to you and your descendants. Remember, we are thinking immediately, like, what about the land? What about the land? God says here, I will give you this land. Your descendants will also be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you, in your descendants, shall the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, or look, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I promised you. And then Jacob woke up. And Jacob is initially freaked out. God was a distant character in his life until this point. Jacob freaks out. And I think any of us might have. A God who had seemed distant talks to him. Just talks to him. And so he sets up a sort of miniature shrine to commemorate that initial meeting between the two. And he makes a vow. He makes an interesting vow. He says this. If you really do these things, if you really do these things, then you're my God. Okay, if you, if you really do these things, then you're my God. It's, which sounds to us kind of like a cynical thing, but Jacob's saying, okay, let's do this. Let's do this. So God appears at this critical moment, his departure from Canaan, the promised land, promises to be with him. And this is the same Jacob who has schemed and lied and cheated his way into everything he's got at this point. But what's God doing? He's honoring his covenant that he made with Abraham. He's like, I will be with you and I will deliver on this promise that I made. I will deliver on the promise that I made. So then, Jacob sets off, and, and he does go look for a wife. It wasn't just an excuse. He does go to his relatives, um, or his father's relatives, to, to find a wife from his own people. Again, very clan-like mentality. And then, sure enough, God helped him. God helped him find a wife. He finds Haran, which was a long way away from Canaan, and meets some of Laban, or Laban, his uncle's shepherds. Laban was his uncle. And he meets this guy's daughter, Rachel. And so Jacob, I think you know the story, he gets enamored with Rachel, right? He wants Rachel. There's this big engagement type scene. You'll, all, you'll often find them always meeting at Wells when they're about to get married. It's just kind of a type scene in their literature. And, um, and uh, so Jacob loves Rachel, and he's like, give me that one. She's pretty, right? And they fall in love or whatever. And, um, I mean, that sounds so cynical, but they <laughs> fall in love or whatever. Um, and so then, it's wedding time, right? They, they make this contract, serve me seven years. Uh, Laban says, okay, I'll give you my daughter Rachel, but serve me seven years, and then you can marry her and whatever. And then, and it says, they were very much in love, because it, it says, like, and it was just like a day for Jacob passing those seven years, right? He loved her. He loved her. And, um, and, then, uh, and then what happens, right? Big wedding night, party, it's a big party, celebration, lots of drinking, because... Laban successfully pulls the switcheroo on Jacob and gives him Rachel's older sister instead of Leah instead of Rachel, right? So this, so we see the character of Laban coming out, right? He's a sneaky person too, isn't he? And so Jacob wakes up in the morning. He's like, you're not Rachel. And he goes to Laban. He's like, that wasn't Rachel. And Laban's like, this is our custom. You'll get Rachel later, right? And so he has to serve him another seven years for Rachel. I mean, he marries Rachel a week later. But then he has to serve another seven years. So Jacob gets totally duped. Jacob gets totally duped by Laban. The trickster got tricked. Right? It's interesting. It's interesting. That's what's going on here. The trickster got tricked. Then, what's next in the story? We're just going light speed, right? Leah and Rachel have this all-out battle of birthing. <laughs> right? And they have this all-out battle of birthing because kids were important. They wanted kids, right? You want kids in this culture. You want especially male children. And so Leah starts having lots of babies, and Rachel's, apparently Jacob's love is not enough for her anymore because she's like, this, I mean, they, and understand, like, this was her role. She saw this as her role. Jacob saw this as her role. He loved her anyway, says that. But, Jake, like, this was her role in their society was to bear children. And, and so Rachel's like, give me children or I will die. And Jacob's like, it's not my fault, <laughs> you know. And so she does the exact same thing that Abraham did, Remember, or, or that Sarah did. Remember when Sarah gave Hagar? This was, this was a custom. This was not a weird thing to do. It's like, if you're barren, then take my maidservant, and she bears legitimate children. That's the point, legitimate children, on behalf of the barren, legitimate wife.
I'm sorry, you guys. Actually, it'll clip back in, I think. I'm sorry about that. OK. Um, so Rachel's upset. She's like, here, take my maid servant. And then it's just birthing babies left and right. And this, and this is how we kind of get the, the 12 tribes going out. They're just birthing babies left and right, left and right, left and right. Leah stops having babies. So she says, well, take my maid servant, right? And it's this brawl because Jacob does not really love Leah. He just fulfills his obligations toward Leah. He loves Rachel. Leah is desperate for Jacob's love, and she does not receive it, right? And so you see this raw humanity happening constantly in Jacob's life. It's raw humanity. This is not a sanitized story about, like, look at our patriarch and how morally upright he is. This is raw humanity. And again, in the dirt and the mud of this raw humanity story, we see God weaving a tapestry that I think neither Jacob nor Rachel nor Leah could see, understand, or appreciate. Right? Because this is how we get the 12 tribes of Israel, out of this birthing battle. Jacob gets his birthright by sneaking and deceiving his father. You know? That's poor grammar, but whatever. Um, so then, Jacob, lots of time passes. Jacob is with Laban, right? He's been living with Laban. He's a servant of Laban. He's not a slave. He gets paid, but his status is still kind of icky. Right? He doesn't have a lot of, doesn't have a lot of clout when it comes to that relationship. So Jacob's ready to get out of Dodge, or Haran. And this elaborate chess game of deception unfolds between Jacob and Laban. And we see certain characteristics of Jacob reinforced, and others have changed a bit since he left Canaan. Because remember, we're thinking about how does Jacob change as a person? How, what's he like in the long-term thing? So Laban, Jacob's ready to leave. Laban likes having him around. Hey, you're my good luck charm, Jacob. This is it. We're in chapter 30, by the way, if you're trying to keep up. Um, Laban likes having him around. Hey, you're my good luck charm, Jacob. Stay. And God had indeed, it says this in the text, been blessing Laban through Jacob's presence. But Jacob insists on leaving. But there was this matter of what belongs to him from the vast flock of sheep and goats, kind of what was his wages during this 14-year tenure. And Jacob comes up with a good plan because these guys don't trust each other. <laughs> okay. I'll take all the spotted, speckled, and black sheep and goats born from now until I leave. And Laban eventually agrees. But these guys, again, don't trust each other, and rightly so, given their histories. Jacob's deception goes without mention, and Laban had pulled the old switcher on the wife thing and doubled his, doubled his time that he had to stay there. So Laban, because he doesn't trust Jacob, he's like, all right, you take the spotted, striped, whatever. I'm going to take these sheep. I'm going, to take, I'm, I'm going to take the ones that are already striped and spotted. Oh, sorry. I'm, um, so what it was was the, the spotted striped speckled sheep born after that day, right? He was still going to stick around for another year or two. All the spotted striped whatever sheep born after that day and goats were, belonged to Jacob. That was his wages. But there were already a lot of those. So Laban's like, I don't trust Jacob. He's going to try and steal them. So takes all the already spotted striped whatever sheep three days' journey away, lest Jacob steal them. And ironically... This decision will aid in Jacob's escape later. This, this distrust, right? What a tangled web they weave. In the interim, there's a strange story about Jacob trying to scheme up a way to magically get more speckled, spotted, and striped animals out of the flock by means of a very strange attempt to manipulate the appearance of the newborns with, when they're mating and stuff. And he hadn't studied genetics, so we will forgive Jacob for trying to do this. But, it, but, ulti- but the point is, he's trying to maximize, he, Jacob is trying to maximize his gains at Laban's expense. So we might want Jacob doing our taxes, but patriarch and namesake of God's chosen nation? Interesting. Jacob's wealth does indeed increase during this period, and Laban and his sons in particular see Jacob's wealth growing, and they're like, he's cheating our dad. And Laban does not disagree. He doesn't say anything. The text doesn't say he says anything, but he doesn't disagree. And Jacob naturally feels that now is a good time to make his exit. Sure enough, God agrees. And he tells him, yep, time for you to go back to Canaan, the land promised to Abraham, Isaac, and now you. Right? It's always called the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but this has kind of been the development of Jacob. So now it's the land promised to Abraham, Isaac, and now you, Jacob. And he ends with a necessary assurance. God ends with a necessary assurance. I will be with you. I tell you, he says, time to go, do the things, I will be with you. Which Jacob needed. Because if Laban and his sons turned against him, he didn't have a strong hand at the table at all. 
He did not have the wealth. He did not have the resources. He did not have the fighting men, right? So it was a serious thing for him to do, to leave. And if it was out of the good graces of Laban, and they obviously did not like him, they thought he was stealing from them, it was a big deal. So Jacob, interesting, this is very interesting in a patriarchal culture, consults with his wives. And we have a record of him consulting with his wives. He consults with Rachel and Leah and is like, your father is a dirty, no good cheat, and we're leaving. This is a paraphrase. And they're like, you're right, he is. We don't expect them to say that, right? These are his daughters. But they're like, you're right, he is. He spent both of our dowries, that no good, whatever. And moreover, he treats us like we're not even his daughters, but he treats us like we're slaves and immigrants, and he practically sold us. They are mad at Laban too, okay? So if we ever thought Jacob was maybe, you know, like having a, a misunderstanding about Laban's character, his wives, Laban's daughters, totally reinforce it. They're like, no, he is a no good cheat, and we're leaving, right? And so here's one place the story is interesting. Yeah, confirms. Now, where is dirty, no good Laban at this point? So Jacob's going to leave, and we learn from this conversation with his wives that his departure is going to be honorable in contrast to his departure from Canaan, which was totally his own fault because he cheated his brother. But here, he's like, Laban is cheating me. And they were like, yeah, he, he screwed us over too, so we're going to leave. Now, where is dirty, no good Laban at this point? It's three days away. Guarding his sheep, right? Guarding those speckled, spotted whatever so that Jacob doesn't steal them. He's looking after his investment. And that's convenient for Jacob, isn't it? And away he goes. Because you can't, if you're, if you're leaving with like wives and children and, and animals and stuff, you can't just like take off running. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like this is a long process to move. And so it's nice that Laban is three days away also with sheep and stuff. And so Jacob has a three-day head start basically. Interesting, albeit, that our narrator describes his departure in chapter 31 verse 20 as Jacob's deception of Laban the Aramean. Our Jacob is at it again. Laban gets mad, understandably, and he sets off with a band of merry and not so merry men to chase him down. They catch up a week later, it takes them about a week, and the night before the confrontation, guess who appears to Laban in a dream? God. God appears to Laban in a dream. Remember when God told Jacob, it's time for you to leave, I've got your back, I'll be with you? God appears to Laban in a dream. And he tells Jacob to leave him alone. He says, say nothing, neither good nor ill to, to, to Jacob, which is a way of saying, don't do anything to him. Laban is still mad, and he's obviously frustrated. And if you read through the dialogue in chapter 31, once they catch up, it's really funny. You can feel the frustration of Laban because he's scared of God who just told him, don't put a hand on Jacob, but he still wants to be heard in his frustrations, right? So he still tells them to him. So Laban confronts Jacob the next morning and postures and huffs and puffs. You stole my daughters like slaves. Actually, they think you're a no-good crook and wanted to leave, but whatever. That's beside the point. And Jacob goes back and forth for a while about who stole what and who wronged who. And Laban's like, if your God hadn't appeared to me last night, I would leave you here with nothing but whatever. You're a jerk. He doesn't say that, but that's, that's kind of the tenor of the whole discussion, right? They're just butting heads, butting heads, butting heads, accusing each other of whatever. But where this all ends, is particularly instructive, right? This is, this is Jacob's little monologue at the end. Then Jacob became angry. So chapter 31, verse 36. Then Jacob became angry and contended with Laban, and Jacob said to Laban, what is my transgression? What is my sin that you have hotly pursued me Though you have felt all my goods, that he was searching for stolen gods. That was another little story. Um, Though you have felt through all my goods, what have you found of all your household goods? Set it here before my kinsmen and your kinsmen that they may decide between us two. If you find anything that I stole from you, Laban, let's set it out and let everybody see and agree. That's what Jacob's saying. These 20 years, 20 years I have been with you. Your ewes and your female goats have not miscarried, nor have I eaten the rams of your flocks. That which was torn of beasts, I did not bring it to you. In other words, like, hey, an animal ate this one. I bore the loss myself. In other words, that was one of mine. You required it of my hand, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. Thus I was. By day, the heat consumed me, the frost by night, and my, sl and my sleep fled from my eyes. These 20 years I have been in your house. Listen to this. 
I served you 14 for your two daughters and six for your flock, and you changed my wages 10 times. Laban wasn't dirty, no good, cheap. If, if the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac, it's another name for God, the fear of Isaac, had not been with me, listen to this, if God had not been with me, surely now you would have sent me away empty-handed. God has seen my affliction and the toil of my hands, so he rendered judgment last night. If God had not been with me, you would have left me penniless, Laban. But God rendered judgment last night. The deceiver, Jacob, was himself deceived. The trickster tricked by Laban, like we saw. And Jacob saw it all plainly. He went through what he had put others through. He saw the injustice of it. And moreover, moreover, after this encounter, remember when he had that encounter with God when he was leaving the land? Now Jacob sees his God persistently with him through it. If God had not been with me, you would have left me penniless, he says. God's appearance to Laban, moreover, gives Jacob immunity. That was Jacob's vindication. He said, the fact that God appeared to you and told you not to touch me means that, like, judicially, I'm in the right. I am not wronging you. You're the one who's wrong. God is our judge, <laughs> right? God is our judge, and he sided with me. I did not wrong you, cheat you, steal from you, or lie to you. I have been divinely acquitted. And that was his response to Laban lambasting him. And so we see Jacob here, our Jacob, right? Consider the journey he's been on. We see our Jacob here depending on God, relying on God, trusting the God he'd heard about, the God of his father Isaac, who was rather distant at the beginning. Jacob had morphed. We've seen him morph from this scheming, deceitful mama's boy at the beginning, taking the blessing and fleeing the land, to this guy who's still rough around the edges, though, is not, he's not completely changed, a completely changed man at this point, I would say. I think that would be us reading our own evangelical conversion narrative onto the story of Jacob. But we see him trusting God, and he appeals to God's justice. Do you see how Jacob is now linked, linked with God, whereas before he was just kind of doing his own thing? And now he's like, God this, God this, God this, God this. Remember when God appeared to him on his way out, and he's like, hey, if you do the thing, then yes, you are my God. And he sees God being faithful to him. The covenant, right? He sees God being faithful to him. God had a covenant with Abraham and with Isaac and now with Jacob. And he's seen it firsthand. God is delivering me. God is delivering me. Jacob is walking with God, as we might say today. God had chosen him and stood by him, not because of Jacob's merit. That should be very plain by now, but because of God's fidelity and commitment. And this change of heart is also evident toward, or this change of heart toward God is also evident by the covenant that the two make at that point. So Jacob says that piece at the end, and Laban's like, let's make a non-aggression pact. This is a covenant, right? A covenant is basically a promise or a pact, right? We're not going to do this. And so um, the, it's a non-aggression pact. They set up this pile of stones. Laban's like, you don't cross it to kill me. I won't cross it to kill you. Done. All right? And then Laban says, Laban invokes the God of his father, Nahor, and the God of Abraham, Jacob's grandfather. They were brothers, Nahor and Abraham. He said. And the God of their father, which was their common ancestor between Laban and Jacob, right? Abraham and Nahor's father. And then Jacob, it, but it's this nameless God. But Jacob says, yes, I will swear by the fear of Isaac. In other words, the God who's protecting me, this God that, I, that my father told me about, the God that whatever, he swears by this specific deity that has protected him, this specific God that has protected him. It was a big deal because it means Jacob actually believed that this God was powerful and would hold him accountable. Because the whole point of making an oath by, the, by a divine name was that like, if you break it, then that God has the right to strike you down. This is what they did. Everybody's swearing by their gods, and Jacob says, all right, I will make this promise according to, to my God. So his dispute with Uncle Laban is resolved. And now he's headed back to Canaan peacefully. Right? So we're coming up to the end of his story, coming up to the end, at least at this part, part of the story that we're going to talk about. But there's one more unresolved dispute in Jacob's life, isn't there? Jacob still has someone to worry about. A certain brother of his who, when we left him, was dead set on killing Jacob. There's no free pass back into Canaan for Jacob as long as Esau is alive. 
And as we move the story away from Laban and back to Canaan with the establishment of this non-aggression pact, the very next thing the narrator says is that angels from God came and met him. And Jacob names the place God's camp. It's right at the beginning of chapter 32. Remember when he left Canaan and he saw the ladder and named it Bethel? It says he named it Bethel, which means God's house. He names it here God's camp. On the verge of going back to Canaan, God reminds Jacob, I am still with you. Because you know Jacob's thinking about Esau now, this guy who wants to kill him. So Jacob comes to Canaan, sends out a conciliatory message to Esau, saying, and he tells the messenger to say, thus says your servant Jacob, followed by a short account of events and his wealth, and it ends with, I have sent to tell my Lord that I might find favor in your sight. Note the posturing in the language Jacob is using. It's entirely subservient. Your servant Jacob, my Lord Esau, find favor in your sight. It's been 20 years, and now scheming, lying, deceiving Jacob seeks reconciliation with his brother. The messengers return, and this is what they tell Jacob. So Jacob sends these people out to, to Esau. Messengers return, and they're like, Esau's coming to meet you. Oh, great. Along with 400 fighting men. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> right? <laughs> Jacob is recorded as being greatly afraid and distressed. I think we all would be. Old grudges die hard, apparently. So he splits his camp into two. So Jacob is just freaking out. He, goes, he gets into go mode. He's like, all right, split the camp, split the animals, split the people into two camps so that if Esau attacks one, at least the other one's going to survive. Um, and he turns to his God. Listen to this. This is chapter 32. His God. Not, not, not so distant anymore. This God that Jacob's been walking with. 32 verse 9. Oh God, my father, God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O oh Lord, who said to me, he's like, you told me to return. Who said to me, return to your country and to your relatives, and I will prosper you. I am unworthy of all the loving kindness and of all the faithfulness which you have shown to your servant. For with my staff only I crossed this Jordan, and now I have become two companies. Deliver me, I pray. He said, I did not deserve your faithfulness. He sees that now. Look at how Jacob's changed. And he says, Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him that he's going to come and attack me and, the, ch- and the, mother of my, the mothers of my children and my children. For you said, he reminds God, you said, I will surely prosper you and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which is too great to be numbered. Jacob is desperate. Here comes Laban with an army. Jacob is desperate. And he's like, God, I don't deserve what you've done because... I was a scoundrel, and you were still with me anyway. Please deliver me. The next morning, uh, to try and mitigate his brother's real rage, he sets up waves of gifts to be sent. 100 donkeys here, 30 camels there, that sort of thing, in increments to hopefully calm down the the, the bloodlust that, that, that he thinks Esau has. And he tells the messengers with these animals to tell Esau that Jacob is coming soon. Like, in other words, hey, these are from Jacob. He's going to be back behind us. Then, like, another wave of animal comes, and it's like, hey, these are from Jacob for you. Jacob's behind us, right? So Jacob's going to be at the end of this train of gifts. And I am amazed at Jacob's boldness here, Right? Because he did have the option to run from Esau. But from the beginning of his entrance back into Canaan, what's he been doing? Trying to reconcile with his brother. Right? And instead of running, even though Esau is coming with 400 fighting men, instead of running, he goes to face his brother. He goes to face his brother. He, wants to, he goes face to face with his deception and his scheme that robbed Esau out of his pride of place in the family. So that night, and listen to, how, listen to how it all pans out. That night, he takes his wives, his maids, his sons, and he sends them across the river to a safer location. And Jacob is entirely, at this point, alone. His animals are gone. His wives are gone. He is alone. And he awaits what, is sure, what, what he is sure is an army of 400 men coming to kill him because of his treachery. And he's just sitting there standing on a hill by himself. And what happens in that moment is one of the most well-known stories in the book of Genesis, and maybe even the Old Testament. It's a pivotal moment 
in the life of Jacob, what happens in that critical moment when he's all by himself. A man ambushes him out of nowhere, and they have this long wrestling match. They have this long wrestling match that ensues all the way until dawn. When the unnamed combatant sees that he has not defeated Jacob, he dislocates his hip somehow and tells Jacob, let him go. Jacob's sitting there clinging. Remember when he came out of the womb? I think this is intentional. Sitting there clinging to this guy. I'm not going to let go. I'm not going to let go. Right? But at some point, Jacob had become aware that this opponent was not a normal man, but the angel of God. Right? And so crippled, but clinging, clinging to this angel, God's representative, practically face to face with the divine. He'll say that later. He demands something. He demands a blessing. He says, I will not let you go until you bless me. It seems like a strange thing to ask from an angel you've been fighting all night, but this request is a window into Jacob's soul. Jacob had always been wrestling, striving, always trying to win the blessing. He, he lied for it from his father, stole it from Esau. God's hand on him blessed Laban, and Jacob wanted that. Remember when he's trying to fix the, fix the thing so he gets more sheep out of it? That wealth. And now face to face with this divine being, Jacob, he refuses to let go until he receives a blessing, God's blessing, because he knows now that it is only God who has the power to bless, not his scheming, right? Not his, not his ways of doing things. He's come a long way. He's come a long way. And then the opponent proceeds to name, to rename Jacob. I, I wish we could go into more detail, but we're kind of running out of time. Um, he names Jacob. He renames him. He says, what's your name? Jacob, not anymore. Your name is Israel. And then he blesses him and leaves. And, and he names him Israel because, and he, he says it in the text, Israel means one who strives with God. Yisrael, one who strives or struggles with God. He says, I name you this because you, strive, you struggle with God, you struggle with men, and you have prevailed. This is the, this is the climax, right? Jacob, Jacob has changed. He's been struggling with God, striving with God, and this is the moment. And then he walks away from that place crippled, crippled, but blessed, blessed and with God's presence. That's what happens. Yeah. So the next morning arrives, and Jacob, limping, blessed, and with fresh confidence that God is and will be with him, sets out to meet his fate. 400 fighting men face his brother's judgment for his deception so long ago. And as this company of 400 approach, Jacob postures. He bows down seven times, just complete subservience, right? He's like, I wronged, I'm in the wrong, whatever. And perhaps the last thing he expected happened to him. Esau ran, not something you did in that culture, ran toward him, embraced him, kissed him, and they wept together. They wept together. That was what happened. Esau was not bringing these men to attack Jacob. He was bringing them to greet him, right? Jacob's and Jacob's reconciliation with Esau, this is, this is amazing. Jacob's reconciliation with Esau was for him staring into the face of God. The one who strived and struggled with God had been accepted by God, and the one who strived and struggled against his brother had been accepted by his brother. And that's why he says in 33.10, I, I see your face. This is what Jacob says after they have the whole weeping moment. I see your face as the face of God and you have received me favorably. You have received me favorably. Man, so many ups and downs in Jacob's life, and this is where it culminates. He dealt with so much conflict. He dealt with so, much, tr so many trials. He was treacherous. He was deceitful, and yet there's this constant presence of God in his life. And God says... And this is us taking, taking something away from Jacob's story, Jacob's life, right? God says, this is the one from the beginning, from before Jacob was born. He says, this is the one that I will choose, the vessel, the eponym of my people. He will be the one who fathers the 12 tribes of my nation. Jacob, Jacob of all people. Jacob was a deceiver, a schemer, an opportunist, a mama's boy in a man's man's world, and he tricked and lied his way to the top receives the rights to the covenant of his grandfather is forced out of the land. And yet God continues after all this to be with Jacob, to be with Jacob and honor the covenant that he had with Abraham. Remember when Sam preached on Isaac and he says, 
uh, God says, because you did this, because you didn't withhold your son, then I'm going to be with you. This covenant is established. Even through all this, God is faithful to his promise and faithful to be with Jacob on his rocky, sketchy, deceitful, opportunistic journey. Imagine. By our standards, God probably should have chosen a more worthy vessel, say, 20 years in of Jacob's life. Remember, we have seen the whole life of man, almost. He didn't, but I'm glad that that he didn't. And thank God he doesn't use our standards, lest we find a day when we don't measure up to them and are found to be alone. No, God's faithfulness, his commitment, his covenant supersede Jacob's buccaneer-like qualities. He didn't forsake him when he left the land, but appeared and said, Hi, Jacob, it's me, your God. I'll be with you during this dark time, and I'll bring you back. The sun sets in that moment in the text. It sets when he leaves, it rises when he comes back. It's very poetic. That dark time in Jacob's life. And the more we get to know Jacob, I think, the more that we get to know Jacob, as we've seen his story, it makes sense. It really makes sense that this man, of all people, becomes the namesake or, or, or the eponym for God's people, Israel. They lived a very divided, very sketchy existence like Jacob did, and yet God's faithfulness to his wayward people, did it ever falter? No, never. They followed other gods, they ignored God, yet his loyal love makes him attached to them forever. He says in Hosea, how can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? My heart is overturned within me. All my compassion is aroused. That love that God had for Jacob and that love that God had for his people is beyond our comprehension, that love of God. And so it makes sense that Jacob would be the person of all people who bears the name Israel and fathers the nation, this opportunist, this go-getter. This series has been about the true and betters, right? That's, I think that's the word you use, right, Sam, the true and better. Like, who's the true and better? Who's the true and better Abraham? Who's the true and better Isaac? Who is the true and better Jacob? It's you and me. We're the true and better Jacob. Deceivers, rebels, not listening, not loving. I could list off a thousand things that we all do. A lot of us like to identify or see us as David or see ourselves as Isaiah's or Abraham's. I don't know. I, we have this ten- I, I had this tendency to do that. Like, oh yeah, I want to be like Abraham. I want to be like David. And I think the more that I live my life, I, I identify perhaps most with Jacob, a man who lived a mixed life. But that wasn't the end for Jacob, was it? God's faithfulness superseded Jacob's shortcoming, and his long game plan for Jacob reached far beyond his mishaps, and God had a beautiful vision for Jacob's life that took decades to unfold, decades. That constant presence of God when I feel my own imperfection, that is what makes me feel like Jacob. God was in it for the long game with Jacob. Don't live your life. I think if there's something that we can we can really take away from Jacob's story. Don't live your life minute to minute in this emotional, spiritual roller coaster as if one slip up mean, means God abandons you. I really used to think this way, even if I wouldn't have said it. I did. What did God do with Jacob? Mark him off? Make him do penance? No, his covenant, his promise means utmost fidelity. A kind no one in this room can fully grasp. God's faithfulness. That's the long game. That's the decades game that God has on your life. God morph in you. Don't be put off by your lack of imperfection. The commitment God has made with you, the covenant God has enacted with you when you believed in Jesus is like the one with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's far-reaching, and you have his fidelity. You have his faithfulness. You have his loyal love, chesed. You have his loyal love just like they did. And that's why Paul says in Ephesians 2 that you you were once far away, strangers, and aliens to to the covenants. He says this specifically, strangers and aliens to the covenant, Gentiles, Gentiles, not Israelites, Gentiles, which I'm a Gentile, I'm not, not Jewish. Strangers and aliens to God. But he says, through Jesus, through the blood of Jesus, you have been brought near. Welcome to God's family. Welcome to this covenant. Welcome to this God who was with Jacob that is the same God who is with you. And that is why they always say the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob. Through Jesus, we receive God's unfathomable unfathomable covenant love, that commitment. Who is the true and better Jacob? I think we are. Who is the true and better Israel? We are. 
striving with God, wrestling with God. It is our existence, and God does not spurn it. His commitment to Abraham and Jacob meant he was all in, through thick and thin, disappointment, letdowns, victories, scheming, broken, humbled, honesty. This is the God of Jacob, and for anyone who puts their faith in Jesus, anyone who puts their faith in Jesus, this is your God, and we are his family. Walk with God. Learn to trust God, as Jacob did. Remember, that happened over decades. He learned to trust God, and he goes from indifference to, I'm all in with God. God's got my back. Test his faithfulness. Actually walk with him, depending on him. Go on that journey of God's love with Jacob. We're going to move into a time of communion. Every Sunday morning we do communion at Off City Church. Uh, the band is going to play a song, and when you're ready, you can come up and get the elements, and then Sam is going to come up and lead us in communion.